Hi, I'm Omri. I'm a CTO for Codex. Codex is a Wix company building awesome tools for developers. And I'm going to be talking about headless components, what they are, why you should care, how to best utilize them. Uh, we're going to go over some popular options and see it by example. And of course, I'm going to share our experience at Codex. The reason I chose this topic is that I see a great opportunity here uh, to exploit a gap in the market in a way that will help all of us. Shameless plug, uh, Codex is out. It's free. It's on open beta since Christmas. You can follow along uh, in the link in GitHub uh, if you're using a uh, desktop. It's an IDE. It's not really for uh, uh, phones. Um, the way it works is you edit uh, React components visually um, and in isolation. And it's a great, very effective way to edit your components. And components are great. That's why we all use them. But we get paid to build apps, right? Components are just a very efficient way of doing that. Um, by the way, this is the only reference to AI, so my gift to you is like 10 minutes without AI. Um, back to our app, we want to build something like a Google Docs clone, and there is a ton of work, and in that work there is this menu thing. It's a pretty basic menu. And if we're feeling very naive, we might say something like, how hard can it be, right? It's, it, the HTML and CSS is trivial. It has open and closed state, a bunch of items, items go click, the end. Except for some secondary behaviors like little things like, you know, Z indexing, accessibility, resizing, pinching, scrolling, focus, keyboard navigation. Well, it's uh, actually a lot of work. And this is, this is not even stuff that's on the spec. Right? This is just stuff we need to do to ship quality product. And I guess that's the reason many of us use component libraries. Either you build your own over the years, which you roll over from one project to the next, or you use an open source or a commercially available ones. Uh, we have uh, material UI and design. It's a big spectrum. Some of them are really good. They all ha have the same premise. Learner stack and you'll be able to develop good-looking UI very quickly. And the good ones really do deliver on that promise, but there is this problem with all of them, right? I call it the customizability wall. And you smash into it pretty late in the project when you find that your table and your multi-select don't feel or don't look the same, and here is the anatomy of the customizability wall. Uh, you promise your product manager a bespoke business logic accessible through a beautiful, unique design. And your design and your uh, component library of choice are having a fight. And if you work like me, this is especially frustrating because you see it very late in the game, because I like to build fast UI to kind of get the point of the business logic across to the client, do some iterations, and then do the fit of finish only on the features that are actually going to be shipped. Uh, so just by show of hands, who here smashed into this customizability wall? All right. So for the lucky few that didn't raise your hand, uh, let me show you an example. And I'm going to be using Codex to show the examples. Uh, so, this is our IDE, and this is the expected behavior. This menu is from Ant Design. It's a really good component library. It's highly customizable. And what we can see here is that the menu has a submenu, and the items can be grouped. And my design calls for an um, icon in group A. We're going to just recycle this icon here. So let me grab it. And this is the data that generates the menu. I'm just going to copy and paste it. Beautiful. And already we see that there is a problem, right? The data structure doesn't take icon for the, for the group. And we can see that, indeed, nothing changed. Just to get the point across, 
I can add it to the actual sub items, right? You can see the, you can see the icon. Uh, but for some reason, we can't add it to the group, and we're kind of stuck. Like, can we solve this problem? Of course we can. We can reverse engineer uh, and design. We can uh, extend the menu. We can parse a CSS rule that targets this individual label and fixes our issue. But it's a bit of a hack. All of those solutions are going to look different than the way we customize the rest of the menu. And will they survive the next upgrade of our dependencies? Maybe, probably. Uh, so this leads us to like a, a, a dilemma between our code quality and the quality of our design and our budget or our deadline. And by the way, this isn't me disrespecting end design. I think, I think they're great. And I think they're really customizable. The, the problem starts with components, right? If I'm going to create like uh, my text, my text component, and let's just look at it in VS Code so I can have a nice big font. All right. If I don't define a prop called class name and I don't uh, spread it on the right. Uh, HTML element, then the classes are not customizable from the outside. Okay, this is a problem or a feature of React components. So, any author of, comp of a component library that comes with like a default view has to opt in to everything that can be customized. The only way to make everything customizable is to not have a default view. And this is exactly what headless components are. You get either no markup or a very basic markup that is designed to be overwritten, and you get no styling whatsoever. This is a pretty interesting offer. Like, we still need to generate all of the HTML, all of the CSS, but you know what? That's the easy part. This is defining your view in the language that you know. And what you get for free, or by using a library, is the main behavior and all of those secondary behaviors that would have taken you weeks to write and debug. And they come in two flavors. Or the APIs of headless components come in two flavors. Uh, one of them is uh, component-based. So you get an abstract component which takes your view or snippets of your view as children. Uh, or you have the hook-based API which just gives you a hook, and you need to construct a component around it, and it gives you all of the functionality you'll need. Uh, this is a bit uh, abstract. Let's look at examples. So, Radix. Radix is a great styless component library, unstyled, uh, which means it does have a default HTML. Uh, it's very basic, and you can replace it. It comes with a lot of very good primitives. It looks something like that. So this is what I meant. Oh. Sorry. This is what I meant with the uh, JSX-based API, right? We have this component here, and we can see that we have co that components that uh, make it up. We have a po uh, popover.root, a trigger, we have the portal that has the content, but everything you see on the screen, all of the view, is defined explicitly in the code. I, said, I mentioned that it does come with a default uh, HTML. Uh, if you want to override it, this is a nifty little feature. You add the property as child, and that will uh, take uh, your HTML snippet, and we'll use it as is. It's not going to wrap it with whatever default view it comes with. Uh, and it will add the different props like ARIA and event handlers, etc. Et really nice uh, library. Really, I really like their API. The docs are incredible. Um, however, it is limited to uh, primitives. So you're not going to find a date picker or um, calendar. Uh, if you need those, you might want to look at uh, React Aria. React Aria is a part of uh, the Adobe Spectrum offering. It's like a full-blown design system. 
but this is one of the under the hood libraries that is open source. Um, and it, uh, it's also an example of our second type of API. This is hook-based API. It looks something like this. Uh, so the behavior is the user type their search, and once it's, uh, and then you have this little button here that clears the search field. Cool. Let's see how this component is defined in code. Uh, all right, so we have this hook, use search field, takes a bunch of parameters and returns these props that are meant to be spread onto whatever HTML you choose. I, I find this API really nice, like very uh, elegant. Uh, it does come with a downside, sort of. Uh, you use a lot of refs, very liberal with the refs, and it kind of piggybacks uh, on a state management library called React Stately. It's also part of Spectrum. So um, other than that, I would say it's a very interesting library, lots of interesting components. Uh, so, so far, I kind of focused on primitives. Let's go to the far uh, extreme of the complex, uh, complexity spectrum and look at uh, React Table. One year ago, uh, the author of React, uh, React Table, Tanner Lindsley, uh, gave a great talk on this very stage explaining, uh, explaining why he went the headless route with React Table. And one of the points he made, uh, by the way, great uh, talk, highly recommend checking it out. And one of the points he made is about uh, simplicity of APIs. So React Table is a big piece of software. It does a lot. It's quite advanced. Uh, it can react to changes in the data and a lot of functionality. A lot of functionality means a more involved API, right? We, need, we do more, we need more uh, to describe it. So let's see how the API looks like. Uh, I'm gonna open this in uh, VS Code again. So, we have something called a table. It has getters and setters, and it gives you a list that you map onto uh, your view. And you might think like this is involved, right? This is a lot of mapping, this is a lot of stuff I need to know, but actually, all you need to do is use the hook to get the table. Everybody knows how to use getters and setters. Everybody knows how to use a map. Right? And everybody knows what this piece of code does. This is just an HTML snippet. So after an initial getting used to period, uh, your skills can be transferred from whatever you're used to onto this project much more easily than a proprietary alternative. Right? So think about how much you can customize in the view of such a complex table. If you had to parameterize everything, just the sheer number of properties you need to dock is gonna completely outshine the interesting functionality parts. So at this point you might think, wait, so it's just more work? And I, I would say yes. I mean, if you're building a POC, yeah, it's, it's gonna be more work to write some HTML and CSS, but for real, project with a unique uh, design, you will probably have to customize all of the defaults, right? You don't want your, uh, your application to look like any other comp uh, application that was developed using this uh, components library. And so you're gonna have to rewrite it. You're gonna use a proprietary way of describing the changes. It's not gonna be less code and it's not gonna be less work. And I keep, uh, uh, keep banging on the proprietary uh, side of things, but when you onboard new team members, it makes a big difference if they need to uh, learn everything from scratch or they can transfer their skills. I would also argue that it is less work because it reduces the chances of a rewrite. Like if you hit the customizability wall later in the game, as you do, you are in the money time of the project, you're probably over the budget, 
and you want to get it done, and whatever solution to this problem you come up with, it's going to be uh, at the expense of your sleeping time. And as a person who values sleep, uh, I, I find like mitigating that risk uh, very valuable. So our experiences with headless components at Codex, um, just some lessons learned. We found that you can mix and match pretty easily. You don't have to commit. Uh, you can start with much what makes sense, and we still have uh, both flavors, like headless and, I guess, headful components uh, living together, playing nice. Uh, we also found uh, that headless components uh, stay, help us keep the separation of concerns uh, for longer, right? Because the behavior and the view are already separated, to mix in the business logic is like no developer wants to be throwing the first stone, right? You don't want to dirty something that looks clean. And psychologically, it creates a nice boundary. Uh, so this is a painful one. We wrote our own headless library, OK? Uh, by the time it was mature enough to open source, uh, Radix was already out. And we said, like, ah, oh, this is, uh, it's not what the world needs right now. Uh, so but our debt, uh, tech debt is your win, right? Because it is out there. Like, uh, these are great libraries. You can use them. You should check them out. Use them in your projects. Um, back to the opportunity, right? So I showed you some great primitives and some niche complex uh, pieces of kit. Uh, but what I think is missing in the headless space is the daily drivers, like advanced forms, galleries, carousels, multi-select, all that stuff that we kind of need in almost every app. Uh, are in short supplies in the headless uh, space. And I think that this is a market gap that can launch uh, anyone's career. And I hope one of you uh, will be on this stage next year and tell us how filling in this gap uh, took your career to the next level. And with that, thank you very much. I'll be answering questions right there.